Most people have a sincere desire to play nice with other members of the human race. There are some people that do not have that desire. Amen? By the way, it's, it's an excellent goal to have to try to play nice with people. Matter of fact, it's a biblical one. Did you know that? The Bible says over there in the book of Romans chapter 12 and verse number 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now you see there that Paul says, it's not always possible. Amen? That's why it's so important in the scriptures to rightly divide. Because Jesus, when he is preaching on the kingdom of heaven, the physical earthly kingdom, when he physically rules upon this earth, he says, if somebody smites your cheek, give them the other one also to smite. Yeah? Not in this dispensation. Paul, our spokesman, says, if it be possible, live peaceably with all men. But sometimes it's simply not possible. Amen? Just drive on, on Highway 75, and you'll know that's true. <laughs> Getting along with other people is good for you, generally speaking. It increases dramatically your, your chances of making friends, of actually making money, of, of finding romance, of raising decent children, and, and doing other stuff that, that simply is good to do. But conflict, as you already know, we've already studied, is inevitable. And, 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 and I believe that in our culture today, it seems to be on the increase. There, there, today, there are polarizing hostilities that spring up from things like politics and civil unrest and, and generational misconceptions, military invasions that we don't agree with, social agendas, unfair taxation, and even holiday gatherings with extended families, conflict. So playing nice is not always easy, and I'm not trying to say that it is. But for the most part, reasonable people are sincerely seeking peaceful solutions to a wide range of ongoing differences of opinion. So our pride and ego want no part of any sort of living peacefully, any sort of quick fix that requires us in our mind to be wimps or, or settle for a compromise that leaves everybody unsatisfied. That's what we think in our mind. Well, I'm not wrong, so why should I compromise? That's ego and pride, right? The natural tendency then is to lash out in order to prevent us from appearing weak or hurt. In other words, we think we can become a jerk, you see. Now, the Bible is full of jerks who have major character flaws, and Paul said these things were written for our learning. Because he knows that in the church, there's also going to be people filled, uh, full of churches that are jerks. So getting to know those people and their sins is a good way to learn and, and to not do the same things that they did. Now last week, we, or two weeks ago I should say, we learned about Solomon's son Rehoboam. Rehoboam, because of his pride, paranoia, and power, refused to show kindness to the people of Israel who cried out for help. Then last week, we learned about Abraham's wife, Sarah, who was motivated by being jealous, jaded, and judgmental to take all of those frustrations out on Hagar. We've learned about that. Not only did she take it out on Hagar, she took it out on Abraham and even the Lord. So next on our list is Judah. And there's so many that we could choose from, but Judah is the son of Jacob. And of the 12 sons of Jacob, it would be Judah that the line through which the Messiah would come, would come through him. The Bible says in Genesis 49, 10, that the scepter would not depart from Judah. But here, he certainly does not act like that he's going to be the, 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 a, a, an ancestor of the king of kings, if you will, because in his treatment of Tamar. Tamar shows up with Judah in one of the worst chapters of Genesis, and, and I should say, one of the worst chapters of Scripture, Genesis 38. And we're going to learn, we're going to see from Judah's pathetic example the reasons why we think we can be so abusive toward other people and be a real jerk face. Now, let me, let me just throw this out there. If you think this series is not for you, I am speaking specifically to you. <laughs> So, just so you know, okay, we're talking about you. 
He said, what about you? Well, I'm definitely talking about me. I'm not even pretending. Okay. That's the difference between you and me. I admit my mistakes. Amen. And there's a lot of them. So now let's get into our study. Why do we think we can abuse others? What, what puts it in our mind that we think we can be a jerk? Well, the first reason is because we think we're entitled. We think we have justification. That's number one. We think we are entitled. Now here in the, the, the scripture, I want you to notice verse number one. This is important. And it came to pass at that time. I find that striking because at that time refers to what has just happened in the life of Judah and in the life of the rest of the sons of Jacob. As you know, previously, they had just all been jerk faces to Joseph. So in the, at that time, when Judah should have been taking care of what's going on with Joseph, they sell him into slavery. They, they are jealous, of course, some more Sarah ministry. They're jealous of his position. They're jealous of his dreams. They're jealous of his coat. And so they, they sell him into slavery with the Ishmaelites. This is at that time that we're referring to. So Judah's already a mess. He's already making poor decisions. He has become a true man of the world, if you will. The very time of the wicked deed reject, regarding his brother, rejecting him, sending him out into slavery, Judah goes out to just take care of himself with complete indifference, not caring about what's taking place in Joseph's life. The world today, by the way, cares nothing, nothing for the suffering. Joseph is a type of Christ. This is amazing to me. There's an indifference that people live today. They don't care anything about the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't care anything about him. They don't care about anybody, anything that makes up his body, the church today. Same thing. Judas is going on with his life. Bible says over there in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 2, and we see this lived out in Judah's life, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. There's a lot of people today that has their conscience seared. In other words, they don't get convicted anymore when they do wrong. Their conscience works the opposite way. The only time now that they get convicted is when they do something right. That's a seared conscience. And there are people that, you realize, there are people that come to church, they go to work, they go to school every day, and they treat people horribly. They abuse people because they think they're entitled to. They think they, they have lived a hard life, they're going through some tra trauma in their life, and so bless God, if I'm suffering, everybody's going to suffer with me. This is Judah. The Bible tells us that Judah takes a Canaanite wife, Shua, and she gives him three sons. Now, that's already his, her, his first mistake here in the book of Genesis. It's very, very clear that the Canaanites were a cursed people. That the Bible says God wanted the nation of Israel to drive out the Canaanites from the land in the first place. And here Judah, who the line of the Messiah is to go through, goes and gets him a Canaanite wife. So, he has three sons. Ur, the firstborn son, was given to Tamar. By Judah. God killed him because he was wicked. Right there, out of the blue. By the way, this is the first record of God killing an individual. Now, I want you to think about that. We're in Genesis 38. With all that has transpired so far in the book of Genesis, including chapter 6, with the sons of God coming unto the daughters of men, and giants being the born of the land, and the wicked imagination, every wicked imagination of the thoughts of men, Right? Every one of them. This is the first time where he is said to specifically kill somebody. Wow. He must have been something else. And then we have Onan. That's the second son. God killed him because he refused to obey the word of God to have a child with Tamar to continue his brother's seed. He refused to do that. So he dies. Well, then you got Shelah. I know that you think that's a girl's name, but not here in Genesis. Okay. Third son. Now, at the time, he's too young to be given to Tamar. So she has to wait until he was older. Now, I don't normally put great emphasis on the meaning of names in the Scripture, but this one was too good to pass up. These three sons, I believe, 
show the steady decline and restoration of the nation of Israel. Three sons. Ur, the word Ur means enmity. Onan means wickedness. Shelah means the sprout. I believe that the first name Ur speaks of the, Jewish, the Jews' relationship to Jehovah since they crucified his son. Then the second refers to their condition as rejectors of the gospel, wickedness to this day. But isn't it wonderful? The Bible says that the nation of Israel will be restored when they call upon the name of the Lord at the end of the tribulation and that remnant will spring life, sprout. Isn't that wonderful? I love stuff like that. You didn't understand a word of that. So let me move on. <laughs> Judah's wife, Shua, dies. And so something bad has happened to, to, to Judah, so he needs comfort. He needs comfort. Look at what it says. Chapter 38, look at verse number 12. And Judah was comforted and went, in, went up to his sheep shears to Timnath and he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. Now, as you know, Judah promised to give Shulah to, as Tamar's next husband. But clearly... Judah has no intention of giving his last son to Tamar. First son, Ur, Tamar, dies. Second one, Onan, Tamar, dies. You kind of can't blame him, but I believe he's blaming the wrong person. Yeah? So what happens? Tamar then sees that he has no intentions of giving Sheila to him. So she devises a plan to trick him. So the Bible says that she dresses up like a harlot. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. Judah, who the scepter will not depart out of, Tamar knew that in order to attract him, she was going to dress up like a harlot. What does that say about the character of Judah at this time? So she dresses up like a harlot. She knows Judah's coming. Judah sees her outside the house. The book of Proverbs covers this well. And she seduces him. So Judah says, without being coarse, how much do you cost? And you know what you What you got? So I so said, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a kid. I'll give, now, now that's not a child. All right, everybody with me? That's a, a young sheep or goat. I'll give you that. And then she said, well, okay, uh, where is it? He said, well, I don't have it on me. I'll have to ship it to you. <laughs> All right. I mean, I don't have it with me. And then she said, well, what are you going to give me to promise me that you're going to give me that? The only thing he has on him, notice what he has. He said, I'll, I'll leave my, my cane with you. <laughs> I'll leave my bracelets with you that's, and my signet, my ring with you, that's what I'll leave. And so Judah convinced himself that the first harlot, by the way, mentioned in Scripture could make him happy. Hmm. You know what you find in the Scripture? Generally speaking, women degrade themselves for material things. Men degrade themselves for a moment's gratification. Sad and disgusting, yet that is still the rule today, by the way. The events surrounding the encounter between Judah and Tamar, I believe, are disgusting in the extreme, yet the, the deeds, the motivations, and the discourse reveal so much about the inner workings of the fallen sons of Adam. Judah believed that he was entitled to act the way that he acted to Tamar on two different fronts. First of all, he had lost two sons. Well, it's almost like Job. He, he lost everybody but his wife, and, and, and Satan killed everybody, right, to make him miserable, but he kept his wife alive. What's that tell you about her? Right? Here, Judah's got Ur and Onan that are already dead. Well, the Bible says they were wicked anyway. Right? Right? But he thinks in his mind, I've had all this loss, I've lost all these two sons, so I'm not going to give what I promised to Tamar. I'm entitled to treat her poorly, right? And this is the only thing she's got left that she can do, and that's to make herself a harlot. 
Judah did that. And then secondly, the fact that he already lost one wife. So he loses his wife, he's lost his sons, so he's got all this lost. Do you know where I'm going with this? So all these things are happening in his life, and he's miserable. And so he believes now, just like jerks do today, that they have convinced themselves that it's okay to hurt others because they themselves are the ones hurting. Life has not been real good to you, so I don't have to make life good for anybody else. That's exactly what Judah did. They feel like they're always disrespected, so they're entitled to show the same disrespect. They, they, they regret the decisions, by the way, that nobody made them make. And so they reject, and then they, they regret all of those decisions, and so they're entitled to make everybody else pay for the dumb decisions they've made in their own life. That's a jerk face. All right? See, their life is miserable, so they're going to make everybody miserable around them. Do you understand that's the opposite of the Christian life? There's no entitlement that we have just because we've been dealt a bad hand in life, whatever you want to call it, which most of the time it's our own fault anyway. I'm saying all the time. Sometimes, listen, sometimes we can just go through life and be happy and just try to, to, to find some happiness in our life and people abuse us out of jealousy, out of them being jerks to us. But that does not grant us, right, the ability to be that way towards somebody else. As a matter of fact, the opposite should be true. You say, listen, I love Jesus and I love God's people enough that even though I'm miserable, I'm going to not make anybody else miserable. Right? See, our homes are miserable because we take out our anger and frustrations on the weaker ones who are not able to fight back. There's a lot of husbands today that make their wives and their children walk on eggshells when they come in the house. Because they're so afraid. And so y'all, you, you know what I always say to these, these dudes that think they're big and bad and treat their family miserable? Pick on somebody your own size. How about that? Why don't you come talk to me and you and I can have a great discussion and we could fix your, as the, as the old preacher, we can fix your attitude adjustment. Amen. <laughs> there ain't nothing I hate where, see these, these men up here saying, I'm telling you what, I've had a rough day. Well, big deal. So have I. I have to deal with you people every week. I'm still happy. Amen. Y'all with me? Right? You're the one that chose that career. You don't like that? Get another career. Go to school. Go to ninth class. Do what you got to do. Get your degree. Do what you have to do. Find something you love. Right? It's not, not your wife's fault. Not your children's fault. Sure not your children's fault. You with me? Judah felt like he could let everybody's life be miserable because he's miserable. We're so depressed because we dwell on what we don't have rather than what we have. And so then we just begin to drown our sorrows in the sea of apostasy, rebellion, and wickedness, thinking somehow we convinced ourselves that that's going to make us happy. All right? See, jerks are the ones who ignore the conscience, the conviction of the Holy Spirit to get right because they convince themselves that they're entitled to abuse others. You know what the Bible says? 1 Peter 3, 9. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for, ra for railing. But contrary-wise, you've got to be the opposite of that. Blessing. Knowing that ye are thereunto called that you should inherit a blessing. Let me, let me throw this out there. I learned this a long time ago. You, you, if you're miserable, right, it doesn't help for you to make everybody miserable around you. That doesn't make you happy. Right? If you would humble yourself and let go of your pride and ego, right, and begin to be a blessing to others, in other words, be scriptural, do you know what will happen? All those things that make you so miserable will begin to get better anyway. Do you know that? Romans 12, verse number 20 says, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heat coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good. You will not produce good when you do evil. Isn't that something? The Bible tells us that. Why do we think we can abuse others? Because we think we are entitled. And secondly, we think it is effective. We think it is effective. We, we think, first of all, we are entitled. And secondly, we think we're doing some good. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 18. 
He said, what pledge shall I give thee? And thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thy hand. And he gave it to her and came in unto her and she conceived by him. Now, let's go back here just a moment. Will you go back to verse number one and, and see how all this, this happened in the first place? And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren. Well, you got that straight. He went to a certain Abdulonite whose name was Hiro. Now, Abdullam was among the cities that God had Joshua destroy when Israel entered into the land. So obviously, obviously, Judah went down to find some friends. Right? That's the first problem. So Hira is out with him. They're having a night out. Judah, man, you've had a rough week. I'm going to take you out. We're going to have a good time together. Judah needs cheering up, so he's going to show him a good time. So here, here's his idea. I know, this is what we'll do. Let's go find a harlot. What a great friend. Great company you're with. So when Judah asked Tamar how much she costs, he promises her a kid. That's pretty expensive, by the way. I just thought I'd throw that out there. David claimed that a man should die for stealing one lamb. Isn't that what he said in 2 Samuel 12? The law said that a man must pay back four sheep for one sheep. So, she was costly. Judah promises to pay the price. Tamar said, you know, give me a down payment. So, ring, bracelets, his staff. The price was made. The transaction is allowed. The deed happens. Look at verse number 18. And, oops, she conceived by him. Hmm. So now, Judah's problems just went from bad to worse. So his good friend Hira goes back and makes the down payment for him. Great enabler, right? But the men say that not only is she not there, but she was never a harlot in the first place. Hmm. Huh. Look at what Judah's reaction is. This amazes me. And Judah said, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Judah was more concerned about looking bad in front of all those guys, right? Than he was getting right with God. Isn't that something? He's more concerned with how he looked in front of his buddies than he did the God of heaven. That's normally how that works. This is, this is quite a glimpse into the thought process of a jerk, right? Judah didn't think it was a shame to lie with a harlot, right? He didn't blush to ask the men of the region where the harlot could be found. No problem. His friend didn't smirk or look upon him with contempt when he told him he owed the prostitute some money. But now he is troubled that someone will put him to shame for not paying a bill to a harlot, that's the thought process of a jerk. See, when we behave like jerks, we really think we're doing some good. You know, we're really making the point. Yeah? We're making sure everybody knows something is wrong. But what you are actually doing is the more jerky you are, right, you're actually making your own life worse. You say, what do you mean? See, what you've done... God has gifted you with people in your life that care about you. Do you know that? There's some people that love you. I don't know how. <laughs> but there's some people that actually not only love you, but have on purpose wanted to be a part of your life. Do you know that? There's some people that, that in spite of the person that you are, still really enjoy your company for some unknown reason. All right? But when you're a jerk to them, you, you know what you begin to do? You begin to put out the flame in their heart that is burning for you. And before you know it, all of those people in your life that God has allowed you to have, that actually care about your life, that actually think that you're somebody, that actually show you respect, that actually put you on a pedestal, that actually treats you almost like a king if you'll let them, you're going to put out their flame for you. To where even then the people 
the, the few people that actually put up with your nonsense will stop caring about your life. And then when you look in the mirror, you can't blame everybody else. You've got to blame yourself. That's what happens. You think you're really being effective. Oh, I'll tell you what, I've had a rough day and I want everybody to know it. But what you're in reality doing is you're punishing people who've done nothing to you. And who are actually there by the Lord to perhaps comfort you. And to perhaps love you. But instead, you're a jerk to them and there's going to come a day, there's going to come a day where they'll stop caring about you. And then you'll really be alone. And then what are you going to do? See, I know you don't, this is not fun to talk about, but what we're trying to do is show you from the mistakes of Judah, see, how we can fix our life. See? We only turn to sin instead of God, and the results in our life are devastating. Say, I ask you, has it really been worth it? James 1.19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Look at this. Slow to wrath. Here's what's happening. You ready? For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. I got news for you. Right? God's not going to fix any trouble in your life. Right? If all you do is show your wrath. It, it won't work. The wrath of man worketh not. That's, I'm going to tell you this. The wrath of man is not the answer. You being a jerk is not the answer to your trouble. Why do we think we can abuse others? I got things to do. Amen. We think we're entitled. We think it's effective. And thirdly today, and finally, we think we're exceptional. We think we're exceptional. We think that we're the exception to the rule. Look at verse number 24. Three months later, I wonder if Judah even had another passing thought about old Tamar for those three months. Doesn't know anything that's going on. And then we get to verse number 24, and it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. Now, they didn't know that her first customer was Judah. And Judah has kept this from everybody for three months. And look at what it says. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. Don't you love how the scripture called, you know, it's not pregnancy in the scriptures. It's with child. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Amen. There's only one preacher here today, not two. She is with child by Horton. You know why? Because it's a child. Isn't that good? The Bible already tells us that. It took us 2,000 years, 3,000 years to forget about that, but it's a child, with child. Isn't that wonderful? You don't understand what we're saying there. Um, and Judah said, bring her forth and let her be burned. Now Leviticus 21.9 says, and the daughter of any priest if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father, she shall be burnt with fire. That's in the law that hasn't happened yet. So, notice that it, Judah was real quick to judge Tamar's sins harshly while forgetting that it takes two to tango. Right? He was her first customer. So Tamar comes in and she's, she's back dressed like a widow. Right? Bring her forth and let her be burnt. So here comes Tamar. I wonder if she's been stewing on this for three months. I mean, you understand, I'm not, I'm not justifying anything Tamar's doing. Y'all with me? We're talking about Judah though. And so I wonder if she just comes in. I, just, I can just imagine this. Because, you know, I'm a man that, that, that maybe tends to be, I know this may shock you, I may tend to get a little more sarcastic than most people. I know, I know, it, it's a shock. But I can just imagine Tamar coming in and she's like, no problem, but you know, I, I, well, well, who, what's, I can just imagine her taking them out of her pocketbook. Well, whose are these? And immediately, that's what I would do. I'm not saying I would do everything that Tamar would do, but I'd probably do that. 
And then Judah realizes, he acknowledges them, and says she had been more righteous than I. Wow. In all of God's word, is there a clear example of the way in which we hold others to a higher standard of righteousness than we do ourselves? Than right here. He says, let her be burnt. Wait a minute. Judy, you're just as guilty as Tamar is. But see, we don't think about that. We really like to pick out all the faults in everybody else. We always like to think about all the ways that they're disappointing everybody in the church and the preacher and the, and the testimony. But you fail to see your own sin. Wow. Now. We don't want mercy and grace for the transgressions, right, of others. And then want to have grace and mercy for us. So let's, let's just for a moment let the words of Judah stand there in verse number 24. Let her be burned. Because Leviticus 21, you know, in the law, that's what it was supposed to happen. But then, why didn't Judah say, and let me be burnt with her. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say that at all. So it's, it, it seems here that just like probably many of your children, just like my children, Judah said, you got me. But that doesn't mean that he repented. Did you see that? Hmm. The deed is horrible, must be punished, right? But Judah said, if I do the deed, it's excusable and it must be pardoned. So in verse number 26, she had been more righteous than I because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son. Do you see that that's the only thing that Judah takes responsibility for? He takes responsibility for lying. That's it. Isn't that amazing? More righteous than he was. First of all, I'm going to tell you something, Judah. Of all the things that you might know, if righteousness came and introduced itself to you, you still wouldn't know what righteousness is. Because if you're saying that she's more righteous in, than you than what y'all just did together, then you have no idea what righteousness is at all. So, he says, you're more righteous than I. Well, it, she, she did all this because I didn't give her my son. Wait, who did this? And so then the Bible says that she gives birth to twins. Now, there's some weird stuff going on right there. This is not a typical, would you say, delivery. Amen. So the first, the, here comes an arm. And so she ties a scarlet thread around it. And then what? Goes back in. I didn't know that could happen. And so then the, the second one comes out, Right. Zara, of course, the, the firstborn slips back into the womb. The other boy emerges first, named Pharaoh. The word Pharaoh means breach. How'd you like to be called that your whole life? Come here, breach. <laughs> Pharaoh, here's what's so amazing. You know, we always say, well, we'll come to Christ when we're good enough. In that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. We could never earn our salvation. You know, over there in the book of Matthew chapter 1, it tells us that Pharaoh's now, the, the daughter or the son of Tamar and Judah, is in the line of the ancestry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pharaoh's is part of the Lord Jesus Christ's family. Wow. But back to, to being a jerk. We, we really become a jerk when we think our sin is not as bad as somebody else's, that we're the exception to the rule. Right? See, this is what we say to ourselves. Well, I only lied. I only do. I, I just have, I have a problem with my ego. It's just the way that I was brought. That's just the way I am. You know, you hear that all the time. Yeah. But at least, bless God, I'm not like, I don't know, like a sodomite or, or an idol worshiper or, or even a murderer. I'll tell you what. I, yeah, I deal with pride a little bit. But bless God, I'm not like those guys. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, you're right. Leviticus 18.22, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with one mankind. It is abomination. 
Yeah, it's pretty bad. Being a sodomite, yeah. Deuteronomy 7.25, The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is abomination to the Lord God. You're right. Being a sodomite's an abomination. You're right. Being an idol worshiper, I mean, you're right. That's an abomination. Proverbs 6. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are, oh, well, look at that, an abomination. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Murder. Being a sodomite, murder, uh, worshiping false gods, and also pride are all defined as abominations in the scriptures. Sorry, you're not the exception. You're not the exception. It, it's so funny how we will hold ourselves to a much lower standard than we hold everybody else. So Judah makes a, you know, a haphazard, a haphazard confession. He states his failure. He never apologizes to Tamar. He never takes any steps to remedy the situation. You know why? Because he's a real jerk face. That's why. And that's what we find here in the scripture. What about you? He, see, he felt like he was entitled. He, he felt like that it was somehow effective. He's really going to change things. And he, he feels like he's exceptional. We do the same thing. We, we really feel like we have convinced ourselves that we're entitled to act this way. Uh, we really feel like that our behavior is really being effective, that we're really sticking it to people. And, and then we really feel like we're the, that, that we're the exception to the rule, that, that God's going to judge everybody else but not us. That is the makings of a real jerk face, right, that has convinced themselves that they have the right to abuse other people. I, I hope that that's not anybody in this room. Let's not be like Judah today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today.